How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's Guide Series on Candlekeep Mysteries, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be taking a look at the price of beauty, and my oh my is there a price to pay. Of course there's going to be a ton of spoilers so players don't watch this, but DMs that want that added insight, go ahead and stick around because we have a lot to cover here. As always our adventure begins in Candlekeep, this is the first adventure that's taking us into tier 2, and it's quite a great one, as your players are going to find themselves having a spa day! Unfortunately, that spa day has some hags in it. Let's go ahead and look at all the details here. Our adventure begins with an avowed bumping into the party saying, Oh, my apologies, I'm a bit frazzled right now. Loris Niss, the avowed that bumps into the party, exclaims that their friend Falthrax Lodare has gone missing, and the only hint about their whereabouts is this book, The Price of Inner Beauty. When your players look at this book, they see that there's a mirror on the front, and when anybody looks in this mirror, then a certain someone pops up. This mirror will go ahead and ask, hey, you know, what do you want improved? In which case, it's going to show these images of your hair being pulled upright and makeup done and looking younger and yada yada, this and that. This book is playing on the sense of ideals that your person has. Once someone exclaims that they want something done, then the mirror is going to activate a portal that appears right in front of the party, in which case they can go ahead and step on in. So it states here that the portal is open for a few minutes and players can choose to go in it or not. If you're running this as a one shot, I would recommend that they kind of just get sucked into the portal. Not in a malicious way, but you know, just to make sure that the adventure is going. If your players feel like having a spa day, or they go ahead and investigate where the missing friend is, then they will hop into the portal and appear in another place. Before we get any further with the video though, I just want to give a huge shout out to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are helping me out so very much. Thank you. Absolutely incredible. Thank you for all the amazing stuff that you're doing. I am putting out some content as well, and stay tuned on Patreon because I am going to be announcing some fun Candlekeep stuff going on over there. Secondly, I also want to shout out Fox Glove Armor and the amazing, amazing maps that are coming out from her. She is putting out these amazing maps, so go ahead and check her out as well. Links down below. Incredible stuff. These are the kind of maps that I love to see when I'm running virtual tabletops because the art just pops, the colors are fantastic, and I certainly can't wait to see what more maps come out. So it's here where we get all the detailed information about the residents therein and of course all of the locations. The thing about this adventure though is it isn't a strict timeline like some of the other ones. It's not a linear dungeon. This can be approached a number of different ways. So for the instances of this video, I will be going over the individual areas. And then at the very end, I'll go ahead and talk about the ways that your players could be approaching this and how you can present this adventure as a whole. So for starting off here, we have the Temple of the Restful Lily. This temple was once owned by a one Silvari Silversong. But unfortunately, Vanity got the best of her, and a coven of hags came through and transformed her, taking over this establishment, which the hags now control, and lure in people to go ahead and make dark deals with them. The hags have a whole host of individuals that they have under their control, and as for Silvari Silversong, they transformed her into a gorgon and locked her away in a bathhouse, which they don't allow people to visit. The three hags, whose coven name is the Fetid Gaze, have an immense amount of detail here, and it's amazing. We learn about Dread Morgan, and we get all these personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws, Vile Saza, and Anti Greenbones. We get all this immense detail about them, about the personality types that they have, what they look like, and most important of all, what they make themselves appear like to most people. As of course, if they were just looking like hags, no one would stop by. But because they transform themselves into three beautiful elves, then people don't quite catch on. What's unique about this coven of hags is that between the three of them, they can perform a ritual which ties someone to a painting, and that way they can go ahead and sap away people's strength, and their youth, and whatever else they deem to wish to gain. But once you start reading through this coven of hags, you'll discover that they all don't like each other. There's aspects about one another that they don't like, whether that be themselves or their minions, and they plot against one another. The reason why none of the hags have killed one another is because they all know that they need a piece of that ritual, and if they killed one of the hags, then the ritual is just gone. 
So their goal is to try and get the other's information and then kill them off and replace them with their own kid. This coven also has a unique set of coven spells that they can cast with one another. The most important of all is the seeming spell that they can cast twice a day. Because with the seeming spell, they make their staff not look like the monsters that they are. And once again, just piling in more and more amazing detail here, we get information about all the hag's minions. We have a front doorman in the form of Saith, a cambion. We have Morty, a hellhound who appears like a dog. We have scarecrows that are staff that never speak. And we also have gargoyles, but they don't look like menacing gargoyles. They appear as if they are awesome looking elves. If that information wasn't enough, we also get all this great information about role playing as the hags and how they meander about the place and try to not unveil themselves before the right time. It's just absolutely amazing content. I love seeing this much detail put into these villains. And here with the dark bargains and cursed paintings, we get the information on how they lure people here and eventually they'll try and feel people out to see if they're willing to try and make a deal. And if anybody does make one of these deals, then they are of course going to lose out because the hags are always going to get what they want. If someone requests that they get stronger, then hey, their stats can actually increase. They can get a plus two to their strength or dex or con or whatever. But the thing is, these benefits only last one year. After that one year, then unfortunately for them, the reverse is going to happen to them. They will grow weaker. Same thing if you want to become younger, then after a year you will become older, etc, etc. And it's here with the magical treatments you can show off what both the PCs and NPCs can be, hope to gain using these deals, but of course these deals don't last forever. The magic of this ritual accumulates in their visage being drawn in a painting. The thing is though, is if you have a painting made of yourself, you cannot damage the painting. The only hope to try and remove any of these curses placed upon anybody is by destroying the paintings. Here's the kicker though, if you have one of these curses placed upon you, you yourself cannot destroy them. Meaning that if all the PCs sign up and say, hey, we're going to get all this stuff, then unfortunately for them, they will not be able to break them. We get some awesome detail as well about additional NPCs around here that are currently meandering about the place. Silvari Silversong, who is now a Medusa. We get Gorba Den Dendrian, and she was a dragonborn who is now brittle and weak and is currently working in the tower. We have Glitter, who was a tiefling, but is now a kobold and is trying to skulk around the place. And we also have Faldrax Lodir, the person that your players are supposed to be looking for. Faldrax is sought to become younger and now is incredibly old. And that, of course, plays into the adventure we have. To make this place truly come to life, one thing you should do is present it that your PCs are not alone here. This place is currently being used by multiple different people. In which case, you can totally use this amazing list of temple guests. We have this amazing list here curated, but of course you can just add more to your own desires. Once your players make their way through that portal, they will find themselves in the high forest and they will be just a jump hop and a skip away from arriving to the temple. Now hopefully your players just go ahead and walk through that front door, but they could theoretically go ahead and go around the side. In which case if they explore around a bit, then eventually Saith is going to approach them and say, hey, we invite you in, just go ahead and use the front door. Saith isn't going to press the issue, however, because he doesn't want combat to incur. But as soon as possible, after dealing with the characters, Saith is going to go ahead and report to the hags that there is a group of adventurers who have stopped by. We get some amazing details here about all of the temple's features in regards to the walls and floors, the doors, the windows, the lighting situation as well as the sales pitch that Saith is going to go ahead and show off once he starts talking to the PCs. He's going to say, hey, you can go ahead and enjoy the amenities of this location for just a whopping five gold each. You can get lodging for four gold a night, etc., etc." Go ahead and make this a sales pitch that feels believable. And once again, when your players make their way inside of here, they should see other people meandering about as well. You should make this place feel absolutely lived in and your players aren't just walking into some crazy weird trap. But it totally is a trap, but you gotta make it feel like it's not. Once your players do arrive to Area 1, the lobby, that is when Saith is gonna go ahead and give off that sales pitch, saying, hey, you want something, we can get it. Saying, hey, if you want something, we can provide, I am here to serve. If the PCs ask about Falthrax, then he's just going to feign ignorance and say, Hey, you know, we have a bunch of people stop by here. I don't remember everybody. And of course, something very important to note here is you should not have a ledger of people's names that arrive here because then the PCs are immediately going to ask that. 
or if they do, you can go ahead and have say say, oh yeah, everybody uses fake names all the time because they're trying to, you know, do whatever. This is a very important part of this adventure, the buy-in. Once again, I'm going to be talking about later on in regards of how your players are going to be approaching this and the ways that they can interact with the world. But this first interaction with anybody from this temple is going to be the selling point. Have say feel likable, make them feel personable, go ahead and give them that whole sales pitch routine and try to get your players inducted into the world around them. In area two, we have the changing rooms. This is where your players are gonna go ahead and drop off all of their gear. And the cool thing is, is this is gonna make them feel like they have some security here because they are given their own key to their own lockbox. There is a master key and of course their things can be stolen later on, but your PCs may not know that. What's also really nice is your players are also given complimentary bathrobes. Awesome stuff. In area three, we have the lounge. This is where your players are gonna spend a decent amount of time as this is a nice just place to relax. They can get Manny Petties here. They can get food and drink here and they can meet with Morgana, who's gonna go ahead and play the role of a gracious host and tell them all about the wonders of this location. She's gonna say, oh yes, our massages are absolutely incredible. Emperors and kings stop by this place because it's so incredible. She's just gonna be talking up the place and she may go ahead and give off a bit of the history of the location to make it feel like she is definitely not a bad person. In area four, we have the garden. When your players make their way inside of here, they'll see that this is a workout area ran by Azirsa. What's funny to note is when your players come through here, they'll be able to see that there is a whole bunch of other people that are looking like they just got done getting worked out and potentially beat up. But make sure to present it not as malicious. You should make it look like these people have come here for a spa day and have just been ran through the ringer getting a good solid workout in. Azirsa is going to go ahead and try and coerce the party into doing some workouts. She's going to be doing some squats, some tug of war, and some chain skipping absolutely fun events that you can go ahead and run but the thing is depending on the type of players that you have they may see damage as too severe as a friendly reminder hp isn't necessarily health points it's sort of like a hero points it's a durability sort of thing so you should make that very painfully aware if they do get beat up during the tug of war and chain skipping events that it's not them having blood drawn it's not about them absolutely getting beat to death it's more about them just losing a bit of their vigor as they are getting beat up over time. If any one PC is able to complete all three workouts, then they are given a potion of Hell Giant Strength, which could prove very useful later on. But as a reminder, there's only one of these potions, so if you do have multiple PCs that succeeded, then it's gonna go to the one who won the most. Or maybe it just goes to the one that she likes the best, because maybe you have some players that are trying to schmooze her up, or you know, trying to be malicious, or whatever the case may be. In area five, we have the bath and hot spring. Your players can go ahead and stop by and just have a nice time relaxing here in the hot spring. But the thing to note here is there is a creature inside, a naiad. Your players might discover this because they've been told about it, or the naiad might go ahead and whisper to them saying, hey, there's something wrong here. Sirena the naiad is gonna go ahead and try and convince the party to deal with the hag somehow. But once again, I will be going over this at the very end here, how your players go ahead and approach the whole situation here. But the thing is, if your players come here and they're good, then the Nyad may go ahead and say, hey, deal with the hags. But if your players come here to deal with the Nyad, then unfortunately for them, she can turn the water into acid and any creature in the pool takes a whopping 2d10 points of acid damage. Pretty cool. In area six, we have the kitchen. Typically, PCs probably wouldn't be making their way through here, but if they start getting a little rambunctious or maybe be feeling a little bit sneaky, they can go ahead and make their way inside of here, in which case during the day they will bump into Greensong, really anti-Greenbones, and go ahead and may discover, if they search around hard enough, that there are some weird stuff going on here. The weirdest things being Beholder Tears, Unicorn Hoof, Chimera Vomit, and a little bit of Assassin's Blood. The funny thing to note here is that Greensong is regularly poisoning the food, not to a detrimental degree, but enough that people notice, and whenever anybody complains about feeling bad, the hags always exclaim that, oh, that's just your bad toxins leaving your body. That's good for you. In area seven, we have the treatment rooms. It is here where your players come to get a shave or a waxing or just a massage. And it's here where they are met by Ilmar Mizrum. He is a Harper agent who came here a while back trying to find out what was going on, 
but he hasn't been able to act upon it because he's been far too busy and presumably working alone. If he grows to trust the characters, he will go ahead and let them in on what's going on here about the coven, about the scarecrows, about the gargoyles, etc, etc. And in fact, if the party agrees to help him out, he can go ahead and cause a distraction in the bathhouse while the party goes to the shrine or to the tower. Should your players look around this location hard enough, they can find a spell scroll of greater restoration as well as an oil of slipperiness. In area 8, the storage, there is just pretty much nothing here. When your players arrive here, they can see one of the staff moving some bits and pieces around here, but nothing too major going on. Nothing to be found, really. In Area 9, the guest room, this is both where the PCs and NPCs are going to go to bed at night. And the thing is, at night, your players may go ahead and hear a noise. And if they go ahead and look around, they'll see a kobold who appears to be looking like picking a lock. When they go to talk to this kobold, Glitter... Glitter will go ahead and reveal, oh yeah, yeah, it was nothing. If the PCs seem kind enough or heroic enough, then Glitter will go ahead and say, hey, I'm actually not a kobold, I'm someone else. You guys gotta help out with this whole situation here as the hags are doing some really bad things. In Area 10, if your players decide to go ahead and break into other people's rooms, they can go to Ilmar's room, and in Ilmar's room they can find a whole bunch of goodies, some diamonds, and a holy symbol of a drow god of beauty, and a chain shirt and a rapier. So if your players do lose their equipment, then potentially they can find us some in here. In Area 11, we have the Abandoned Shrine. Your players may come here because they're curious, they may be told that there is someone that's good here, or they may be told that there is something bad here that needs to be slain. Whichever the case may be, your players arrive and they can discover that this place is a little hard to get into, but with enough fin angling, whether they make some athletic checks or climb through the roof or whatever else they may be, they can go ahead and make their way inside. Inside, your players will discover that there's a whole bunch of mirrors and these mirrors are shattered. So if you have people that aren't exactly on the up and up when it comes to Medusas, they may not think of that. But if you do have experienced players or they just got done watching Clash of the Titans or whatever else may be, they may think to themselves, okay, we're definitely going to get into a fight with something that can turn us to stone. And also very important to note here is that that broken glass also doubles as giving disadvantage on stealth checks as well as if you aren't wearing any footwear, then you will treat this area as if it is Caltrops, which theoretically could happen if your players have lost all their equipment, but we'll be getting into all that fun stuff later on. In area 12, we have the sacred pool. After your players make their way down the stairs, there they'll see this Medusa, and Silvare is going to go ahead and strike out. And of course, she's going to try and leverage the water weir to her advantage. But here's the thing. If your players come in here just guns blazing, expecting to kill things, then yeah, it's just going to be a traditional combat. But if your players come in here and they know for a fact Silvare is a good person, then they may go ahead and try and reason with her. And that adds a fun dynamic to this combat. Your players get into a fight and they immediately try and ward themselves off, try not to turn to stone, and they of course try not to drown, and they go ahead and say, hey, 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 let's go ahead and work this out. First, your players have to make their intentions good by presumably not attacking, and secondly, they need to make a DC 15 persuasion check. The alternative to this is they could go ahead and theoretically fight Silvari and fight her until she gets knocked out. But of course, that has its own set of detriments. Should you players go ahead and convince her that they are not here to fight, then she can go ahead and blindfold herself and then she can talk cordially to the party. She promises that she'll do everything in her power to go ahead and help out the party, which could be a blast. How often do you get to have a Medusa fight alongside you going against a coven of hags and a whole bunch of other enemies? That sounds like an awesome time to me. Of course, if you players come here after destroying the painting of Silvari, then this is not a combat encounter at all, as she is back to her normal good self. What's really cool to note here is there is a pretty awesome item to be found in here. Submerged in the pool is a weapon called Radiance, a plus one Wand of the War Mage, but it also has the additional benefit. A creature that is attuned to Radiance can use a bonus action while holding it to cast the Enhance Ability spell. But you can only choose yourself when you do this. Once this property is used, you can't use it again until the next dawn. This wand is Silvare's, but she's willing to go ahead and give it up to someone else. In areas 13 through 18, we have the tower itself. When your players arrive here and try to make their way in, they'll find that the front door is locked. They can overcome this by either bashing it down or by picking the lock. But the thing is, is if they go to that front door, then they may be assaulted by the gargoyle, which once again, it doesn't look like a gargoyle. It looks like a winged elf, which looks pretty cool. The gargoyle is not going to attack the party, however. The gargoyle will go ahead and report to the hags that there is someone breaking in. And of course, you can have that fun thing where you go ahead and time the event, your players explore around the tower for a bit, and then the three hags go to confront them. In the first room, area 13, the tower foyer, your players will come across Gorba. And when they see Gorba, they can see that she is so weak she can barely hold a broom. 
and that is because she wanted to become strong. She fears the Hag Coven, of course, so she's going to go ahead and try and shoo away the party. However, if your players are persuasive enough or your players make a DC 20 persuasion check, they can go ahead and convince her to talk about what's going on here and show off the rest of the tower. Once again, both doors are locked, but your players can go ahead and bash them in or break them using some thieves tools. In area 14, we have Saith's room. Your players make their way inside of here, and this place is luxurious. However, if your players start searching around the place, they can find a suit of scale armor, which has infernal glyphs on it, which of course betrays his infernal nature. In area 15, we have the tower studio. This is the location that the hags take people to in order to paint them. Should your players start searching around in here, and if they are successful in opening the chest, then they'll discover the horrible little devices needed in order to enact that foul ritual. Making successful medicine or perception checks, they can discover that there are human skins and demon acres and all this other terrible stuff. Your players look around and the canvases are worth 200 GP and the paints are worth 100 GP. However, finding a buyer for such vile materials might prove very challenging. In area 16, we have the tower kitchen. This is where your players are going to find the person that they may be searching for this whole time, Falthrax. Falthrax is looking old and withered, however, because Falthrax wanted to look young. So Falthrax is going to go ahead and try and shoo away the PCs, but the reason for that is because he fears the gargoyle in the corner. He's going to try and lead them away, but at the same time trying to convince the gargoyle that he's not betraying the hags. So for this, I would go ahead and recommend that he's trying to shoo them away. With a successful insight check, your players can learn that Falthrax is either trying to look at the gargoyle, trying to convince the party to slay the gargoyle, or maybe just trying to reveal that he does want to leave, but is unfortunately being held hostage. If your players fight the gargoyle, it is going to try and run away once it gets to half hit points. It's trying to smash through the window there. But if your players are successful in killing the gargoyle, then Falthrax is going to break down and tell everyone, hey, you know, here's what's going on. This place sucks. Yada yada this and that. In area 17, we have the victim's quarters. This is where your players will find where everyone who has been unfortunate enough to fall victim to the hags is currently living. And this is also where your players are going to find those beautiful paintings. And it's here where you'll see, okay, you know, there's these paintings of these people, and we have just met some of these people because presumably they have to go through Falthrax in order to get here. So it's here where technically your players can go ahead and start smashing things, unless, of course, they have already fallen victim to the hags, in which case their painting may go ahead and rest up here, and they can't do anything about it. And lastly here, we have Area 18, the Hags Lair, the top of the tower. Your players make their way up here, and unfortunately, they may discover a glyph of warding explode upon them. If they make a good investigation check, they won't get hit by it. But if they don't, then unfortunately they are going to get hit by that 5d8 acid damage if they fail that dexterity saving throw or half as much on a success. It's in this room that your players will be able to find all the mementos of everyone that's ever fallen victim to this coven of hags, which is presumably in the hundreds. It's quite a lot of people over the course of time. Most of the items in this place are worthless, but there is a spell scroll of clairvoyance if your players search around. So now that we've gone over each individual area, let's talk about the ways you can go ahead and approach this whole mission. First off being your players arrive here for a spa day. So you tell your players, okay, you just got done doing some crazy adventures. Maybe you want to go ahead and have a spa day, in which case you get the book, you open it up, and you have a relaxing time. And then slowly over time, you reveal to all of your players that there's something afoot here. You go ahead and have some things pop up. You go ahead and reveal that something's not right. And if any PC expresses great interest in wanting to change, then the hags are going to approach them and say, hey, if you really want that, we can make that happen for you. In which case, they're going to lure them back to the tower and go ahead and enact their ritual. Doing it this way allows you to have a fun moment for the first part, and then a slowly investigation part, and then finally a final confrontation. If you go down the regular route of your players already know that someone's missing and they arrive here, they might be a little on edge. In which case, then your players are going to be immediately looking around for something if they sort of don't buy into it. In which case, that can be a ton of fun as well. You have your players show up here and they know something's amiss and they start looking around. And then you can go ahead and start showing off the different factions. Maybe they don't know who to trust. Maybe they think that some of the employees are good and some of them aren't. In which case, they'll go ahead and maybe side with one or the other, depending on how personable they get. And that's when you can have those fun dilemmas of... Do your players talk to the Naiad because they think it's good? Or do your players go and deal with the Naiad because they're told that it's an evil spirit that needs to be dealt with? And the same thing with Silvari. 
Your players may be told that this person is good, in which case your players show up here expecting to talk, and then, of course, something goes down. But your players may be told that this is an evil being that needs to be destroyed, in which case your players show up here and come with a different agenda. The different ways your players could be approaching situations, depending on who they trust and who they don't, is really amazing. It's amazing how there is a tiny little sandbox in a small adventure, but it works so incredibly well. Of course, another way your players could show up is theoretically swords blazing. Your players may just show up here and think that everyone's evil and go ahead and start hacking away. In which case, of course, some people are going to be not kind to that. But the other thing to consider is there isn't just the PCs here. There is also a whole bunch of NPCs here. There could be just some common folk and, of course, all those other fun stat blocks you saw there. There could be a knight, there could be some thieves, spies, whatever else. This is supposed to be a super duper roleplay adventure, and I say try and live up to that as much as possible. Dissuade combat outright. But, of course, if combat takes place, then be responsive to that. Of course, some of the people around here aren't just going to stand around and get killed. They're going to run away and try to get reinforcements. They're going to try and contact the hags. The hags are going to try and reconvene together because they know they're stronger together. If your players listen to certain NPCs and discover that the hags are who they are, then they may go ahead and try and confront them. In which case, they will be smart to try and attack them one by one. Because if they attack them as a coven, then they have those coven spells. And naturally, they're just going to be stronger in numbers. Hopefully, your players can get to the bottom of this before they make any dark deals. And then they can go ahead and save the day. But if your players give in and want something changed for the better, then unfortunately for them, they are going to be in for a terrible time. Once your players have dealt with the hags and the servants in this area, then of course they are free to presumably loot the place, but more importantly, free its denizens. So the thing is, is if your players are smart and assassinate the hags, then I would go ahead and say that the minions here wouldn't stick around because, of course, if three hags get killed, then why would Saith stay around here? Why would the Scarecrow stay around here? They'd probably just go ahead and flee. With Falthrax saved, he's going to show back up to Candlekeep, and he is going to go ahead and reflect on his experiences here. He is probably going to change for the better, but of course these things take a little bit of time. And lastly, if your players are able to free Silvari, then Silvari may go ahead and reopen this place up for good, or she may go ahead and destroy it. I personally like the idea of her making this place good again, so that way she can go ahead and invite people back here, and it'll actually be a good experience, and a way to erase the memory of the evil hags. But if you see fit, then absolutely she may go ahead and destroy this place and not allow anyone to come here ever again. Either way, she's going to be extremely grateful to the party. This adventure was an absolute blast run, and I also listened in on another game, and I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. I personally think it is one of the strongest contenders in here. It is just so much going on. So many great NPCs that your players can interact with. It is a sandbox that you dump your players in, and they can decide where to go, or you may go ahead and have a pre-planned location. Maybe you say that they show up in the morning and there's a daily routine of you work out in the morning and then you get mani petties at midday and then you get massages in the afternoon. Maybe you can go ahead and serve that all up to your own desires. Go ahead and play it as you see fit. But most important of all is play up the NPCs and make sure that the players don't feel alone. This place is constantly lived in. There's a ton of moving factors here. There's just so much going on. Make them feel like this place is awesome. And reward that creativity. Reward them interacting with other people. Heck, maybe your players find out that there's hags. And maybe the hag says, hey, we'll go ahead and kill one of the other ones if we can get that info and we can work out a deal. You know, there's so many ways your players can approach this. And I just absolutely love it. I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. So go ahead and tell me. Do you plan on running this thing completely as written? Or are you going to go ahead and add some stuff of your own? Are you going to add more or less minions? Are you going to have your players explore around the entirety of the place? What is it you're going to have your players allowed to do? Go ahead and tell me all of those things because I want to know. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you to all my amazing patrons up here. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.